people of God. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, hey, let's do that again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Amen. It's so good to be here. Today's reading is from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. One of the key themes of Paul's letter to the Ephesians is unity. 
We here are called to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called as God's people. We read from Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in the love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Here ends the reading. Let these words remind us, us of God's, God's presence in our lives. Hello, friends. I am so glad you're joining us for worship today online and here in the sanctuary. And I can tell you for our song this morning, I need everyone's help. The children, the youth, and most importantly, all of our grown-ups too. So we're going to use our lap drums to keep time during the song. And when you hear the word unity, I need everyone to put their hands in the air when we say unity. And yes, oh, that was very good. Very good. Very good. And then in the middle section, there's some clapping. So remember, our special word is unity. And unity is sort of a grown-up word, meaning to do things together. And together we are united in Christ and united today in worship. So let's try it together. How very good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. How very good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. How very good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. When we So Krista Potter is going to lead us in our time with the children today. And so Krista, come on up. Pastor Jen is away today. Thank so you, Brian. do you want Thank the you. children to come forward today or to yeah. stay in their spots? Yeah, I want the children to come forward. Come on down, friends. I miss coming down. Come on down and sit with me. Then it won't feel so empty. Walking feet, walking feet. Oh, that was such a fun song going to be hard to come right after that act. <laughs> Good morning, friends. Good morning. Now, I don't know about you, but I have heard a couple of words that were repeated over and over today. I heard the word one. How many of you heard the word one repeated over and oh, did you hear that? I heard it. It was one this and one that. Yeah. And I also heard the word unity, which I love because that brings us all together, doesn't it? So the message was a complicated message today. Can I read it for you? The Ephesians message today was, there is one body, there is one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And do you know what I was thinking? I was thinking about how the one kind of glues everything together. Is that what you were thinking too? The one is kind of like the glue that holds us all together in unity, which brings those two words all together. 
So one, all those ones, and the unity brings everything together. Will you guys pray with me? Yes. Awesome. All right. Let's bow our heads. God, thank you so much for being the glue that holds us all together. And everybody says, Amen. Yay. Wonderful. Now, we're going to be outside, grown-ups. We're going to do a project outside, and then we'll have a little bit of time to play on the playground. So you can probably find us outside. Thank you so much. Let's go, let's go have some fun, friends. Hang out with us. <laughs> All right. Thanks, friends. Come on. Let's I love the children. My goodness, I love those. Our second reading today is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, and 11 through 16. We are called to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called in unity. However, unity does not mean uniformity. Paul tells us that Christ gives the church a diversity of gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. We continue to read from Ephesians chapter 4. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself captive. He gave gifts to his people. The gifts he gave were some that would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed, and, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way unto him who is the head, unto Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Here ends the reading. May these words give us wisdom and strength for the work of our lives. I love one of the words from that, and I'm going to be using my body pack. I'm back to the body pack, folks, back there. We're good to go. I love that word that we just heard among many from that Ephesians passage, speaking the truth in love. Both parts are so crucial, speaking truth and speaking the truth in love. Let us bow in prayer. Oh God, out of all the words which are spoken this day, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, may it be your living word that remains and abides with us, your living word that sticks with us and gives us life and life eternal. In the name of the Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we make our prayer. And let all God's people say, Amen. I first heard Bishop Michael Curry preach when I turned on the TV for the early morning news just a couple of years ago in the summertime. I was making my early Saturday breakfast like I always do, and I turned on the news like I always do, uh, seven days a week on TV. And there from London, instead of the news, there from London was the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. I'd totally forgotten that that wedding was coming up and that it would be during my news time that I wanted to watch so much. And at first I was disappointed, but I caught it just as, as Bishop Michael Curry was getting into his sermon, and I was capt captivated. Such a sermonic combination of the Episcopalians and the cadences and fire and joy of the historic black church. 
Michael Curry, you see, is the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in the United States and was raised with wonderful influences in the Episcopal Church as well as in the resilient, expressive, historic black church of his grandmother. You need to read his book sometime if you get the chance called Love is the Way. Bishop Curry tells about picking his grandma up one day when she was in her 80s. She and her friend crossed a busy street and stepped up a steep curb to get to Michael Curry's car. When they made it, they turned to each other, grabbed each other's arm and said, our God is a good God. And Michael Curry said that he remembered chuckling and thinking about how his dad would tease his grandma all the time saying, you folks talk about the Lord so much you would think he lived right next door. God was right there for his grandma, he said, front and center. As the Episcopalian hymn puts it, O God, unseen yet ever near, thy presence may we feel. Or, as the gospel hymn puts it, yes, God is real. The Apostle Paul in our scripture today is talking to those early, early Christians about the God who is real. And he says this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. First, there is one body. God is real in the one body that we experience the reality of sometimes more at times than at other times. Now, Paul is talking about the body as the body of Christ here. One body with many parts, each contributing in its own way. You know, I've seen the body of Christ in action in many different denominations, both working ecumenically as a pastor, which I love to do. And back when I was in college and I tried out every single kind of denomination there was, I think, from high church Catholic and Episcopalian and Eastern Orthodox to Presbyterian and Methodist to excited Pentecostalists and Baptists. And what it comes down to, I think, is love. Do people love each other? Are we the body of Christ? Do people love the stranger, the newcomer, the person at the margins? Are we the body of Christ? It comes down to love. The other night I heard someone share about when she was a single mother and she showed up at a church she'd never been to before and she was just enveloped with love by the people there. And she kept coming back and back and back and they kept enveloping her more and more and more in love when she didn't know if she would be. That's the body of Christ at work. That's where God is real. As John Wesley once said, the person of true religion, the person of true religion is the person whose faith is filled with the energy of love. The energy of love. Who can you extend yourself to this week? That's the body of Christ at work. That's being church. There is one body, Paul says. Second, there is one spirit. God is real in the spirit. Now, your experience of the spirits may well be different than mine. But I have found so often that the Holy Spirit is at work when there is a combination of holy excitement and holy trepidation, both at the same time. I know that when Bishop John Hopkins shared with me that he wanted to appoint me as senior pastor at Centennial, 
I had this combination of holy excitement on the one hand because of all the things that God was doing in this congregation called Centennial, and I also had this sense of holy trepidation because I knew there was this steep learning curve and there were new things I was going to be launching into. Holy excitement, holy trepidation, both at the same time. Every time, folks, that we baptize a baby here, I hope there is holy excitement at what God will do in this child's life. And I hope that there is holy trepidation at the responsibility of what we as a family of faith are taking on with this child. Every time we take on new adult members, every time we confirm new ninth graders, like we will do with eight of them this fall, eight of them, I hope there is holy excitement and holy trepidation going on at the same time. Are we living up to what we promise these youth? Are we living up to what we promise these new adult members who come with dreams and hopes of encountering God and being part of a breakthrough with God and with God's dream for the world? Holy excitement and holy trepidation, both at the same time, they're marks of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes just plain comfort and strength are marks of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes plain blunt truth is a mark of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes bold courage is a mark of the Holy Spirit. For every generation, every generation in the church, the Holy Spirit is at work. Are you and I helping stir the Spirit up all the way from generation Y and generation Z up to the greatest generation at every age and stage in times of exuberant joy and in times of unimaginable loss? There is one body and one spirit, Paul tells us. Third, there is the one hope of your calling, our scripture says. And it's not just talking about the calling of pastors to be pastors. We all have a calling. There is one hope of your calling, the scripture says today. God is real in hope. You know, every time... You and I turn around this summer. It seems like there's another new climate challenge. Another new wildfire in California or Oregon or just north of the boundary waters. Or another new flood in western Germany or China or wherever. Or another drought. Or great world powers making serious military plans to use the Arctic Ocean to ship cargo, to create shipping lanes in the Arctic Ocean. Can you name any time in history when this has been true until now? But we are a people of hope, folks. What is one thing you can do to provide hope in this time? Can you support the firefighters out west or up north? Can you give to the Red Cross or to UMCOR in our humanitarian efforts? Can you and I drive less? Can we work for a bold new world that prioritizes climate action? Because if we don't, the next generation and the next generation, they're going to have to all the more. If we conserve God's good earth, isn't that being conservative in the best and deepest sense of the word? We don't have to give up. We are called to be people of hope. Fourth, there is one Lord, one faith, our scripture says. Those early Christians were always facing pressure to call the Roman emperor Lord and God. To call Caesar Lord and God, that meant, among many things, 
that many early Christians died in the Roman Colosseum or other Roman arenas because they would not call the emperor Lord and God. It means something when we use the word Lord and when the early Christians used the word Lord. As C.S. Lewis and his Christian friends called the Inklings used to talk about when they were together at a brew pub together, if they were put on trial for being Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict them? That's such a good question for, for me in my life. And at the same time, for me, for us to remind ourselves that everything is undergirded by God's grace. If we were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? How will you cultivate the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5 in your life this week? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How will you and I love our enemy as Jesus taught? That's not the way the Roman emperor taught. That's the way Jesus taught. How will you and I be Matthew 25 Christians and welcome the stranger, feed the hungry, clothe the naked? That's being a Jesus person. There is one Lord and one faith. Fifth, there is one baptism, Paul tells us. Now, we could do a whole set of sermons on baptism, but I'm just going to say this. Every time, every time we baptize a child in church, when the water is being poured on or applied or sprinkled on the brow of, of the baby or the child, I ask you to think about touching your brow in that moment. When the water goes on the brow of that child, touch your brow in that moment as well and claim your baptism. Claim God's grace that is there for you no matter what happens in your life. Claim this God who suffers with us in the most tragic times of our lives. Claim this God who gives us purpose in our lives to share grace with others. Claim this God who baptized you in the first place. Yes, claim your baptism. You are part of the family of God. There is one baptism, our scripture says. Okay, to recap, Paul writes in Ephesians today, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And today we, we could image that differently. There is one God and Mother above all, in all, through all. One God, our Creator, who is above all and in all and through all, right? So finally today... Yes, there is one God of all who is above all. Think of the expansiveness of that. Who is above all and through all and in all. Here's that theme of unity that we've been talking about from Ephesians the last couple of weeks. Remember the verse from the first chapter of Ephesians where it says that God is gathering up all things, all things in heaven and on earth. Here's this theme of cosmic, if you would, and I don't mean that in some cliched sense. Here's this theme of cosmic unity that Paul is, is pointing to and seeks for us to live in the deepest parts of our hearts. This God is above all, through all, in all. This is the God of the universe and beyond. Think of how expansive this God, this creator is. The earth spins around its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles an hour at the equator. It takes 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.1 seconds to do so. 
This spinning creates our days and nights. And as the earth spins, Edward Hayes reminds us that we are on another circular journey as we orbit around our sun. We travel at the speed of 66,600 miles per hour, and this second journey around the sun takes 365 days, 6 hours, 9 minutes, and 9.54 seconds to complete. We travel 595 million miles, and this completes our year each year. Finally, Earth, as a member of our solar system, also races through space at 43,000 miles per hour. Folks, this adds perspective to our prayer life. We are planetary pilgrims together. God is above all and in all and through all. And our resurrection faith says that there is nowhere that God's grace stops. Amen and amen. Please stand as you are able to sing with us. Please remain standing and let us turn to our affirmation of community. This is our official reconciling statement, reconciling and welcoming statement of Centennial United Methodist Church. And I invite you to say it with me. Centennial United Methodist Church has a place for you. We believe God welcomes all people. We value diversity and recognize the sacred worth of every person, regardless of age, race, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, gender identity, physical or mental ability, economic means, marital status, education, or faith history. With open hearts and minds, Centennial United Methodist Church is a reconciling congregation. If this is your first visit, welcome. If you are returning, welcome home. You may be seated. We love because God first loved us, the scripture tells us. 
And that is why we give up our offering every Sunday, because it's a way of saying that throughout the week in every part of our lives, we love others and we love God because God first loved us. Let us give as faithful and joyful disciples. You would have seen this in the bulletin, but uh, during this time of our early reopening, we're not passing the offering plates, rather the offering baskets are at the back doors. And for those who are watching our service online, uh, recorded online, uh, you'll find the uh, giving logos and ways that you can give uh, at the end of the uh, video of the service today. As we move into our time of prayer together, I would uh, uh, ask you to pray for the family of Bob Rosine. Um, Bob died in June 2020. Uh, however, the service celebrating his life is this coming Sunday, March 1st uh, at 2.30, uh, with visitation at one o'clock and also visitation after the service. And then I also have uh, uh, very new news. You may have seen it on the congregational email last night. Uh, very difficult, uh, tragic news. Uh, Matt Allen, uh, son of Randy and Bob Allen and brother of Josh and Zach and grandson of Dennis and Faye Hunt died unexpectedly in his sleep on Thursday. Services will be held this Saturday, July 31st at 2.30 here at Centennial at the Roseville campus with visitation at one o'clock. So please keep all of Matt's uh, family and friends uh, in your prayers. Let us bow in silent remembrance and prayer before our spoken prayer.
O God of hope, in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death, as well as in the midst of the sunshine of life, we commit our cares to you. For those struggling with health issues in their lives, for the onrush of the Delta variant of COVID, especially dangerous to the unvaccinated, for those struggling with their relationships with their children or parents or spouses, for people in the caring professions and all professions, all walks of life who find that perhaps they have just run a marathon during the worst of COVID and now find that they are running another marathon just to keep up. For those who work to protect our country and those who respond to emergencies. For those who work to build bridges of peace between nations and nations, between group and group. For those who work to diffuse tensions between peoples. For our children as they enjoy summer and as they wait for vaccines to be approved. For our teenagers with all the pressures of social media and bullying upon them. Help us to be there for them as their family of faith. And particularly for the family, the loved ones of Matt Allen, young adult who was raised in our church, who was part of our confirmation and youth program, 27 years of age. We pray, help, help them, and help us to surround them with our love. Oh God, fill us with that compassion for others' troubles, which helps us lay down our own troubles to the side. Fill us with the warm spirit of knowing our own humanness with all its warts and joys, humanness that warts and joys that we share with every other person on the planet. Fill us with confidence in our own abilities and the joy of discovering new abilities. And fill us with the glad hope of your beloved community, of your beloved community, where we weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, where we work for justice and freedom and peace for everybody, where we care for creation and its needs, and where every day we walk closer to you. In the name of the Christ, the Christ of resurrection life, resurrection life both now and forever, we pray as we pray the prayer he taught his first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing, O Church of God, united. Please stand in body or spirit.
And now, my friends, go in peace. Serve the Lord. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And let everyone say, Amen.